Now here we are in 2023, and Asia's position at the top table of the global economy is pretty much assured. It's not come without some tensions, of course, but um, underneath all that has been another phenomenon, which has been the rise of the Indian CEO. Now it's become quite clear that shareholders of some of the world's biggest companies, whether it's Fortune 500 or other global conglomerates, have trusted Indian CEOs to become stewards and custodians of some of these huge global businesses. Now, this is a topic I'll get into with my next guest, a gentleman named Sanjay Sama, the MIT professor who has now become and who's been tasked to head the Asia School of Business in KL, whose mandate it is, is to help prepare tomorrow's leaders today. As always, if you can, do subscribe to the channel, uh, like the videos if you watch them, uh, it would help a great deal if you could. And so, dear viewers, may I now present Sanjay Sama. Sanjay Sama, thank you for doing this. Quite Such a privilege. Pleasure. Yeah. Uh, we've been trying to get this together for some time. Finally, we have you in front of these two friends. Um, let's start where, you know, um, your origins in, in India, right? Um, you've come from the India Institute of Technology. Then you went on to, I think, um, Carnegie Mellon, where you did your master's, and then on to Berkeley, where you did your uh, PhD. And then now we, you're at MIT. Um, talk, talk to us about that path, that journey, right? It's, it's a path... It's a journey which is quite well trodden by by folk from your from your country. Describe that journey for me. Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I remember my mother pulling me aside and saying, "Listen, son, you know, sort of it's IIT or bust. You know, we're, yeah. we're a poor country and uh, we're not wealthy. We're educated. So I studied for IIT. A bunch of us studied. I got a few of us got in, and then uh, I was a bit of a wild kid in IIT actually, and uh, um, I made it out. Um, and from there, I went, uh, wanted to do something completely different. So I went to work in the oil industry with Fish in uh, Scotland. And then from there, I actually hurt my knee while I was there, decided to take a How? sabbatical. How? Well, you know, I heard it playing soccer, and then I heard it again playing uh, on the rig, and then I heard, I finally blew it out playing tennis a few years later, but I have screws in there, and I knew I was sort of wobbly on the rig. You don't want to be wobbly on an no, icy rig. No, you don't. Sea. No, you don't. So I went to Carnegie Mellon, CMU. Then my wife went to UC Berkeley, so I joined her there. Uh, got a, got my PhD, um, and then came to MIT. If I can get into your head a little bit, Sanjay, because um, you seem to be the not atypical Indian native in the sense that you're quite the super achiever, of course, um, in terms of all the work you've done, the, the books you've written, the, the papers you've written, uh, some of the startups you've, you you founded and sold. As well. We'll talk about that later. But um, you are the progeny of, um, well, quite a... I guess, illustri illustrious family in India. I think your father was quite high up in the government and your wife's uh, family also also within the government as well. What was their mode of uh, parental management? Were they quite hands-on and micro or did they were they quite laissez-faire in terms of how, how they you know put inputs into you? Very laissez-faire. Yeah. Very laissez-faire, but always very intellectual. Yeah. It was always about math and physics and all our conversations, but very laissez-faire. Never so discussions wanted. at the dinner table would comprise what kind of stuff? Um, politics and uh, history and um, physics. And I mean, to this day, my octogenarian father sends me, you know, physics articles. And um, this is very intellectual. Uh, yeah. Government and international policy and economics, you know, uh, and sports. <laughs> so how does, how does that fall upon a 12-year-old's ears? Because I try and talk about those kind of things to my, my kids and they're like, you know, <laughs> they switch off, right? We didn't have much TV then, you yeah, know, in India. Yeah. We didn't have yeah. TikTok. Uh, yeah. Black and white TV was about it when I was a young child. Uh, cricket only entered, uh, I mean, uh, color TV only entered with uh, the Indian, uh, the, cr the uh, Cricket World Cup, which India won in 83, and suddenly color TV took off. That's right. Um, but, um, so, you know, we didn't have that much. It was all about meeting and talking. And uh, family dinners were all about that. I'm, known, I'm also an only a kid. Um, and so it, we were a small family. And, and I had a huge number of friends. And we grew up in a homogenous neighborhood where all the parents of that sort of, you know, ilk. Yeah. I'm in touch with many of them. Yeah. A few of them are CEOs of big companies in the right. US now. Um, and um, so it was a very interesting culture. You know? Yeah, so I want to raise that that point because um, it it seems to me that the last 10, 20 years has been has seen the real emergence of the 
you know, the consummate Indian tech CEO, right? You've got people like Sundar Pichal, you've got people like uh, Indra Nui, nu, uh, Nui before, a little bit before that with PepsiCo, uh, AJ Banga, MasterCard, and of course, um, you've, got, you've also got Satya Nadella at Microsoft. I think one or two of them could even be your peers, right? Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think that explains that uh, phenomenon? You know, I've struggled. I mean, I can certainly English helps. Yeah. English is a huge advantage that Indians have. Um, tech skills, math skills, which were not in vogue in the 80s, right? I mean, if you took a, a math degree, it was something you did because you can get something else. Suddenly became good, right? Engineering skills became good, uh, became important. So they had the tech skills. But I think also it's sort of the multicultural aspect of it. You know, you live in India, but in India is very diverse. Then you go to the US, you've got to discover how to make, make a go of it. You've got to figure out how to assert yourself. Indians are quite assertive. That's one advantage they have. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's talk about that because I've, um, well, um, you know, MIT, some of your alumni, uh, your peers as well, I want to talk about this this report um, that, that came from Jackson Liu, Richard Nesbitt, and Michael Morris. And the title of their particular research was why, why East Asians but not South Asians are so vastly uh, represented at, at the corp- higher echelons of the corporate world in, in the US. And that seems to be quite a phenomenon, right? So, so, the cornerstone of Jackson Lu's research was that um, they, the, 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 the South Indians have a certain element of assertiveness, which is that vocalness, the ability to speak up and to stand out and be heard, whereas the East Asians are more by culture, more in, in a way introverted, right? Do you find that to be a truism? Um, well, I mean, I can't argue with the st- statistics and Jackson's work is very good. I do know that individually I have... I have very close friends who are East Asian and I find them assertive and fun and brilliant and so on. I do think statistically, um, uh, of course, there are like NVIDIA, of course. you know, you of have course, Jensen uh, Huang and all yeah, these guys, yeah, right? AMD, you know, yeah, right. amazing uh, yep. uh, leaders of uh, or Broadcom, right? That's Malaysian. Right. But uh, the Broadcom gentleman. guy is more like a founder, right? He wasn't hired per se, German, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so I think what it is, that's a good point. I think what it is is... Uh, because India is so diverse and so, I mean, maybe part of the reason that India um, uh, you know, has its struggles is it's a very uh, rambunctious, argumentative society. So the result of that is that the people who come out, come out with, a, you know, with an element of uh, willing to be assertive, but also combine that with a willing, willingness to sort of understand the situation, read the situation, you know, play the room, uh, understand the audience, read, read the, the crowd. Audience, right? yeah. yeah. So maybe that's what it is. Um, and then in the end, uh, you know, you need to be a techie to be a tech CEO. So Arvind, uh, you know, Krishna, right. who's, a, who's the CEO of uh, IBM, for example, right? I mean, he rose through the ranks and next thing you know, after their struggles, he becomes CEO. So uh, maybe that's what it is, a combination of language, tech, multicultural, um, making it as an immigrant and assertiveness. Yeah, and of course, the new YouTube uh, head honcho is, I um, can't remember his name, but he replaced Susan Wujici, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So is, is there something to be uh, um, kind of communicated to the, you know, the future leaders of, of the corporate world in the sense that, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to be a good sportsman. It's another thing to be, you know, a good ac- ac- academic. Um, but it's quite another to to be, you know, to learn to be to to speak out, to stand out, right? And th- th- I think that was something that Sheryl Sandberg wrote about when when she wrote the book Lean In, right? And, but that was in the context of female leadership. But it's it's more broad ranging than that because you need to stand out, you need to speak out. And in the world where there's a lot of noise, that's all the more important. Do you teach that at MIT? I mean, is that kind of thing discussed? Uh, <clears throat> yes, it is actually. So. Um, you know, it's sort of interesting. I mean, if you take the British Empire, the British Empire was created by uh, glorious amateurs. I mean, leaving aside the ills of the colonial world, right? I mean, these people would just go into a new world and learn to sort of learn language and then uh, assert themselves, right? The Rhodes Scholarship, you know, it's based right. on that. It's the glorious, you know, you're well-rounded. Sports was important because you yeah. learned to, uh, uh, to play in a team, but yet you had to assert your skills, right? So um, I do believe that assertiveness is important, but there's a difference between assertiveness and measured assertiveness. Measured assertiveness is when you have the power to assert, but you assert it in a way that's constructive. You assert it at the right time. You read the room, right? Um, And that is a learned skill, and it's also contagious. And if you're surrounded by people who do that, you tend to do more of that. And I absolutely believe, I think it's essential, because when you're trying to do something new, when you're trying to innovate, 
if you just uh, want to, you know, sort of go with the flow, it's hard to lead the team, right? There's a difference between managing and leading. Managers manage your budget, you know, manage your plan. Leaders say, you know, we need to go in that direction, right? And that takes assertiveness. So here's the thing, Sanjay, because in your read of the corporate world and how it's evolving, right? Um, we might have come from a time, say, in the 80s when you had your Gordon Gecko types, right? Hard charging alpha males, you know, win at all costs. And then you, you've now got the more urbane, more, more erudites, more well-spoken, eloquent people like, like, you know, AJ Banga, for example. But then things seem to be evolving quite quickly. Now, it's kind of like a, the, the corporate world and the business world seems to be quite much more touchy-feely, much more empathetic, you know, ESG and social governance and all that kind of stuff, right? And then I guess perhaps a good manifestation of that could be your uh, Shu Chu. I can't remember. I don't know whether it's the right pronunciation, but he's the guy that heads TikTok that faced Congress and all the all these lawmakers in, in America. And he got vociferous. Um, he was he had four hours of, of deep grilling, I mean, barbecue style. And he was, you know, he was not your hard-charging CEO. He was quite, you know, self-effacing, quite gentle, quite empathetic, but then quite forceful as well. So do you see, do you see that the corporate world, the leadership mold is changing, do you think? I think so. I mean, you yeah. still have the Elon Musks of the world, right? The bull, the uh, highly assertive, in-your-face but I think that the vast majority are of the latter type. You got to walk and chew, chew gum at the same time. You got to assert when you need to assert. You need to lead a team. You need to show empathy. I mean, we just went through hell with COVID, right? That's right. You got to pivot the company. You got to win people over, and that is a combination of skills. And you got to know which when to uh, to use with skill, how to sort of uh, modulate them. And I think that is the future. I thought he did a fantastic job in front of Congress, by the way. Uh, and you know, if you see like Nadella or you know, or all these people when they when they're in front of. Uh, audiences, they're really able to both be authentic, but also adaptable. It's not manipulative. It's actually authentic. When you start getting manipulative, you sort of screw up at some point. Exactly. Right? But these are authentic. Well, Zuckerberg didn't seem authentic when he faced Congress, right? But you know Nadella, right? I mean, you've known him since way back when, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, so we went so, to school together, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So so um, was he, has he always been like that? Did he become like that? Was he nurtured that way? or I mean, what's your... I mean, in the context of being instructive to future leaders, right? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I knew him as a kid, you know, yeah. we were all sort of kids um, and I'm, you know, stayed in touch over the years, but I think you become that, you know, you become that. You, you know, we're we big AI systems. Yeah. We talk about AI now, yeah. you know, I mean, why did, AI systems are looking for things to learn from. That's why, by the way, Twitter is trying to, you know, ramp down throttle, right? Because yeah. AI systems are scraping all those chats. Yeah. We have to be like that. We have to look at every chat and learn, every discussion and learn and adapt. What could I have done differently? I think reflection, reflection, that is the thing that is essential in these great leaders. They reflect, you know. And then they, um, and then adjust they change, accordingly. they adjust, yeah. You know, actually, I realized the other day, I do it myself, uh, you know, every weekend, I look at my calendar for the previous week, not the next week, and I reflect on the meetings. And uh, partly to see which meetings I could have avoided, right? <laughs> but then I sort of, it's led to this thing where I think back at the meetings and think, what did I get out of that? Was it good? What could I have done differently? Uh, and I realized that uh, without uh, being conscious of it, reflection is essential. You, we have to be AI systems. We have to be better than AI systems to beat the AI systems. Is that possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, can an AI system negotiate a contract? Can it think of ESG? Can it think, can it resolve a conflict? Can it, uh, you know, design a new strategy, which is not uh, cookie cutter? AI systems are cookie cutter, right? Hopefully we're better than cookie cutters. Absolutely it's possible. Well, as we know it today, maybe not, but in, say, five years time, and they're evolving at warp speed, Sanjay. Yeah, but they're all stochastic parrots. Emily Blender, a professor at the University of Washington, said it's a parrot, but it's a stochastic parrot. It means mm -hmm. it's got a lot of history and memory and statistics, right? Well, AGI is the one we've got to watch out for, right? Artificial general intelligence. That's yeah. the one that, you know, kind of like, uh, mimics the human, you know, system, right? Yeah, but look, I mean, it's like this. I mean, the, I look at AI and I go, look, we're all shocked with ChatGPT, right? November 2022. You won't remember the first time you logged That's into right. ChatGPT and you typed something and it spoke back to you and you went, oh my God, right? But really, what is ChatGPT? A ChatGPT is a large language model and a large language model is essentially a predictive typer that just goes on and on, right? You know, and you, when you type in your iPhone, you go... I will meet you at, and it tries to complete yeah, the yeah. restaurant, except it goes on, and then we will order sushi, and you know, that's what it is. So why is it startling us? Because we looked in a mirror, 
and we found language staring back at us. A lot of what we are is language. Our thinking is language. Our planning is language. A lot of our knowledge is ingrained in language. And so chat GPT stared back at us and we thought, oh my God, that's a lot of what we do, but it's not all what we do. And that missing element, we don't give it enough value. It is enormous. Take, take self-driving cars. By today, we thought we'd all be driving self-driving cars. Not even close, right? The easy stuff's been done. The hard part is all the other things human beings do. And we have to really examine ourselves to discover and appreciate that. So before we talk about your work with the Indian government, which I think you still do, yeah, to some yeah. degree, right? Um, let's talk about how you look back on your week and try and genuflect and try and be constructive about the, your meetings, interactions, right? That, that is something which I find quite interesting because it's, it's about being constructive about oneself and being present and all these kind of things, right? What kind of things do you watch out for and, and how do you construct, how do you take a constructive approach you know, to, to constantly hone your interactions? So my wife caught me doing this and she sort of pointed out I do this, so I'll tell you what. And then I had to sort of reflect on it at a meta level. So I, I look at the meeting and I go, do I have a good feeling about that meeting? Was that constructive? So in something that's coming up or something that... Always by? in the past. I look okay. at the future as well, right? Okay. I have to look at the rest of the week to figure out which meetings I can get out of, right? But I look back on my calendar, which is pretty packed, and I go, hmm, that meeting, you know, I don't feel really... I don't think I achieved a lot. Maybe I could have done it this way, you know? Um, I I thought maybe I was maybe a little rude. Maybe I shouldn't have been. I'm really rude, but, you know, even though I have a feeling... Uh, or I say, maybe I wasn't assertive enough. You know, I do that. But my wife caught me doing it and I said, did you realize you do that? And I thought, oh, I guess I do. She's right. How did she notice you doing it? As in you were like consciously because, looking through your... Yeah, yeah. I was looking at the calendar. I was muttering to myself. And she goes, what are you doing? And I went, oh, but, but then I had to surface what I was doing. And, yeah. So Brian Armstrong of Coinbase does this mm -hmm. to some degree as well, especially when he does the hiring, right? So that's yeah. not good. But in terms of you, so how do you kind of demarcate, say, for example, a social meeting? What kind of things do you want to get out of it? If it's a work meeting and it's just, you know, a bunch of people, what is the objective? So, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, social meetings, I I really want to be myself and have a good time. That's really my objective. I do not want to be not myself. If I'm not myself, it I probably shouldn't have done it. But can you really, though? Yeah. I mean... Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because you know, to, I mean, to some degree, people play roles, right? I don't. I no. I'm yeah. I stopped doing that a long time ago. I had to do it. Yeah. You know to, but the that it's semi-social. It's not social. You're yeah. there angling. You know, mm -hmm. but now you know socially, if I'm with someone, I want to be myself, and I want them to be themselves, and I want it to be just fun, right? Yeah. And if it's a cognitive load beyond that, it's not worth my time, right? Um, work meetings, I again want to be authentic. I don't want to lie, right? I want the other person to feel like they're being authentic, and I want to get stuff done. Right? We, did we make progress? It could be a disagreement. It could be like, let's meet to figure this out. You're one place. I'm one place. Can we have a respectful outcome where we disagree? Right? But also understand what we disagree on and then we can chew on it. Right? And if I'm the boss and I have to make a decision, look, here's my decision. I'm sorry. This, I'm just, this is my decision. I know it doesn't make you happy, but this is what we're going to have to do. So I just want um, authenticity. I guess if I had to put it in one word, it's authenticity. Yeah, I think within the first five minutes of meeting you the last time, uh, you said Wiswick to me, and then I said, what Wiswick? What you see is what you get, right? <laughs> so in your work with the Indian government, right, um, and we know that within the next 30 years, India could well overtake, if not already, at some degree, because it's, it's so vague, right, population sizes, uh, overtake China as the world's most populous nation. They haven't, well, they made a, well, some would say they made a meal of it so far, right, in terms of the economy, right? Um, how do you think they should do it going forward. So India's already crossed China, by the way. Yeah. It's just crossed China. Yeah. Well, um, according to... The just population. Yeah. Total numbers. Yeah. And, well, according to some United Nations yeah. numbers that I saw. Um, I think the th thing about India is it's going to go the Indian way. The Indian way is to disagree. It's to not... It's, it's you know, it's democratic. I mean, that's the good news, uh, mostly. Uh, but... Uh, it's argumentative, it's fractious, um, but it, maybe in its own way, it's authentic, you know? I mean, the stuff that happens is authentic. Um, and so it is hard to line up things, you know? There's no magnetic field to line up the iron filings. These filings will point in any direction. That's a disadvantage. The advantage, though, is 
it's extremely entrepreneurial, right? Um, and so there's a lot of bottom-up activity. I mean, if you go to a grocery store in India or if you go to a little corner store, they're extremely creative in the way they source, sometimes too creative. Some laws may be broken, right? That's a problem. Uh, the way they procure, the way they sell, the deals they strike, the personal service, it's quite extraordinary, actually. And so I think what will end up happening in India is we tend to judge every country, like Malaysia, India, China, Indonesia, you know, Kenya, we have a, a lens, a lens that we've learned from the success of basically Western countries over the last hundred years. We think cities should look like this. We think commerce should look like this, right? But it doesn't. There's a lot of smallholder farming in India. But most retail in India is tiny little single proprietor stores. In America, it's Walmart and Amazon, right? So when you look at it through that lens, it doesn't work. But in its own way, it's actually empowering and it works. Because this, uh, the individual has a lot of say, right? The little corner store may, may not compete with the McDonald's because there's no McDonald's. I mean, there is a McDonald's, but it doesn't take off. So that's the advantage of India, and that's also the disadvantage. So then how, I mean, in your work with India and consulting them and advising them, right, how do you think they should take their place at the top table with China and Russia and the, and the US and there's this power struggle going on and, you know, um, it hasn't really asserted itself on the global stage, even though we might say as a people they do assert themselves. Yeah. Um, China's made a great, you know, great song and dance about its common prosperity and this and that and, and what have you. So they are seen to be the, the big foe to America, but India is just as big if not bigger in the future, right? Yeah, but I, again, I think that's a lens. I mean, why should it assert itself? I think it will. I mean, it's soft power, you know. It's Bollywood. It's these CEOs. Uh, it's. I mean, for example, so I'll give, give you an example. So uh, about uh, 15, 12 years ago, um, the uh, uh, Nandan Neil Kenny, one of the founders of Infosys, uh, created um, a, an agency in India to come up with a new ID for Indian citizens. I actually was uh, one of the authors of the document that became what is called the universal ID system now called Aadhaar. Yeah, so you work with RFIDs and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it came out, it, I, th this is just a number, but yeah. I used uh, some uh, uh, skills I had in designing numbers for RFID, and of course RFID is also RF and ID and sensors yes, and all that. But I just used the numbering uh, skills. It turns out to be quite difficult. Yeah. So India came out with, and I was involved in, as I said, in that, with a numbering scheme and a biometric identification. No card. Okay. Just a number and Eyeballs, a biometric. Thumbnail, switch part. Fingerprint. Index yeah. finger, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's transformed commerce in India. So if you just go search, right, on India digital commerce, it's transformed by the fact that every Indian citizen has an Aadhaar, which is a number and a biometric. And now that's attached to a whole bunch of other things. It's helping with commerce. It's helping with the... Uh, you know, with uh, e-commerce now, there's a new e-commerce framework, and the number of transactions that are happening per second is is mind-boggling, right? So that uh, layer has enabled that f chaotic India, in its own chaotic way, to achieve a very different chaotic type of success. I think we're very limited in some respects all over the world. We're given a lens to look at something through. And we look at it and go, well, but in that lens, you're not doing well, because that's what we expect you to do, Right? But if the world actually all operated in a way that was compliant with the lens, we could not sustain the growth we have. Yeah? So if you look at highways, well, if everyone bought a car, the world would collapse. I mean, the amount of CO2 would produce, the price of oil, etc. So I just question that I think we fall into the trap, in my view, of judging the world through lenses that we handed rather than the lenses we should create which may seem a little philosophical and maybe I dodged your question entirely. No, that's okay because um, the people make the country, right? And the country yeah. is that, that which takes its place in the, in, the, in the structure of the hierarchy of things according to where they should be. Right. Um, so so when you talk about people looking through life in a th different way, right? These are the these these are the the weird the weird guys, you know, the alternative thinkers, you know, the Steve Jobs and you know yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Um, square pegs on the round holes. Exactly, right? And these are the guys that change the way things uh, appear. I mean, Elon, Elon Musk has talked about solving the world's traffic problems by going underground and underground. You've got infinite landmass you can just dig tunnels through, and that's quite revolutionary. We, you know, no one has thought of that thought of that until now. Um, but how do you, how do you inculcate um, cu curiosity? Um, you know. Yeah. You uh, know. Yeah. Curiosity is an amazing thing. I mean, my God, that's to me the thing that humanity needs. So, I mean, curiosity. If I can uh, sort of take a step back. 
curiosity is to the human brain what hunger is to the human mouth the human digestive system when we get hungry we generate saliva right when you get curious the brain generates dopamine curiosity novelty they generate dopamine there is a survival thing i mean if you get curious uh you look for things for example you might let's say you were a hunter gatherer maybe you try to eat that other thing maybe it was dangerous you got sick but you learned that so curiosity is what takes humanity forward and it's a very fundamental asset in uh human emotions very fundamental and it is cu- it is in fact infectious you ask people about my parents right the gift they gave me was curiosity but it's not for everybody you I don't see that is. in most people in any given organization if a, people are a company of 100 people i'd wager that the majority of them would be just um you know cookie cutter people and a small minority of them would be kind of like um you know entrepreneurial you know in, innovative cu- curious guys most of them will go home and watch um you know um the kardashians and some of them some of them might go home and go and learn new skills whether it's video editing or whether it's i don't know whatever coding or whatever right um we 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 talked about this in in you know the, the the organization of the future they need alternative thinkers because alternative thinkers think of faster better cheaper ways of doing things rather within the organization rather than outside on their own steam and it's a, it's an ongoing thing but how how do you know, because as someone who heads you know an organization which trains you know executive leaders for the for the future can that be natured can that be nurtured or absolutely. is it nature absolutely absolutely so when i talk to people even uh the uh receptionist at a really cutting edge company i can see the difference i mean and literally if i took captured in a word it would be curiosity you know they're like hey you know good to meet you i mean for example there's a google office next to mit you know the way they operate the way they talk to you maybe the person, it's a hiring policy thing though it's the hiring thing. and it's infectious and it's hiring policy it's both uh i've seen uh, i've seen in in organizations i've been involved in people go wow you know that's interesting can i do that and you go yes and they become involved you know i have a 80, 80 year old lady who uh, works at mit she cleans the um, we have a, this lady she cleans uh, all the offices at 6 pm and she's 80 doesn't have to work she does it because she gets bored she's from the caribbean and she's a great friend of mine and she's quite amazing actually and she'll ask me all these questions you know just sort of She, they they surprise me she just wants to know she just wants to know yeah. you know she'll yeah. ask me questions about uh you know she said the other day you know i'm here now and so i go to mit very infrequently she said oh sanjay i haven't seen you in some time where are you i'm in kuala lumpur what are you doing there you know asia school of business oh really but you're an engineering professor and she's the lady in you know in the cleaning staff why are you do, doing business you know and so it's sort of very interesting uh curiosity i don't think should be hermetically sealed in the ceo suite i have seen it literally spread it across an organization by the way the receptionists the drivers they connect across organizations better sometimes than the rest of us but if you're trying to um teach curiosity how do you do it you awaken it you awaken it you don't teach it so you think it's latent it's absolutely latent i mean think about it every human child goes from zero to language That is an incredible feat. Children, feat. Sanjay, most, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. But speaking, right, or walking, uh, you know, uh, is quite a feat. It is a greater feat to go from nothing to language than it is for Einstein to go from, you know, Newtonian physics to relativity, right? So if that is true, then all, I mean, in fact, I think we spend our edu- our time in education. shutting curiosity down we have expressions in the english language right curiosity kill the cat yeah why though? nonsense it shouldn't be though it shouldn't be yeah. yeah or all good things come to wait nonsense yeah don't wait yeah copy dm right yeah um so the thing about uh asia southeast asia in particular i think i think the vast majority of economies in 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 this region are family owned businesses right you know your your atypical patriarch that runs the business and he's first generation passes on to his children and the way the culture is in those organizations we see them time and time again it's very very domineering very very um dictatorial people who are hired within those organizations are basically people who say yes and never no but the existential threat to these businesses at a time when we've got huge uh, evolutionary change I mean some of these come to, I don't want to name some of them but we these are household names they might be gone in 50 years time because they just haven't moved quickly enough 
Yeah, look, I tell you what's happening right now. You may have a successful dry cleaning business and you feel pretty good about it. And you hire employees and uh, you pay them, you know, just enough to get them to work. And you think you're doing great. But there's someone in Lithuania. Absolutely. Saying, how do I completely revolutionize the dry cleaning business? In Lithuania. Yeah. Right? Mm. I actually happen to know a company in Estonia that did that in some respects. Because he spent some time there on your sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> no, he actually moved to Boston um, okay. after he started his company in Estonia. And and then he's going to figure out how to scale it and come after the business here. Right? Very good. He should. He must. He should. So y- you're right. This patriarchal w- approach worked up to a point. But now you've got to tap the powers of creativity and curiosity and question the status quo. Otherwise, someone else will for you. So do you think that these family-owned businesses in, in Malaysia and Singapore and the Philippines and Indonesia and, and Thailand, you know, we see these are household names, right? Do you think they'll listen? Do you think they will, they will try, you know, the second and third generation would, would hire people that will question them, which is completely against the grain of these family businesses? I don't know them well enough. I can tell yeah. you in India, a lot of family-owned businesses, the second and third generation, um, often, they modernize and they go big. And they must, right? And they must. Yeah. Uh, and th- once you say, I want to go big, mm. you're forced to go through this reflection. And a lot of them are well-educated in the sense that you have the mental space to think, uh, you know, unconventional thoughts or to think philosophically. And, you know, philosophy is a way to generalize, right? You generalize, you go, why can't I do that? Why can't I do that? Why can't I go online? And these are some of the things that I see some of the smaller family businesses who've become larger organically, do in the third generation and then go really big. I've seen this happen a few times. I don't know enough about Malaysia to judge it, but I do think it has to happen. Well, one thing Malaysia wants to do, and this is something which is often trotted out by the policymakers and the government, is that, oh, Malaysia wants to be IoT and this and that. My sense is that they don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> but 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 let's talk about in the, in the context of your book. You, you wrote one, I think, some years ago with uh, Kenneth Traub and uh, Linda Bernardi, right? And you, you, you had a look at it from a kind of 360 point of view. So without talking about Malaysia's IoT, IoT aspirations, what does it take? I mean, what is it all about? What is IoT? IoT is besides the point. That's the point of the book. Yeah. You've got to figure out what the hell you're trying to do. Let me give you an example. Yeah. Ford or Proton sells cars in Malaysia, right? Now, the question is, do you really want a car or do you want transportation? Do you really like looking for parking? Do you like paying for gasoline? Do you like getting dinged and chasing the the other party to get your insurance, to get their insurance number? If, if I live in Boston, do I like skidding in the ice, right? Or getting a parking ticket or what I did recently, which is forget to pay my insurance and, you know, irritate my wife. Owning a car is a pain. What I want is transportation. If you want transportation, this is where Grab comes in or Uber comes in. They go, click your finger and I'll give you transportation. Grab is an IoT company. Why? The driver has a smartphone. The smartphone has a sensor. It's called GPS. It's connected to the internet. Right? The passenger has a smartphone, has a sensor called GPS. It's connected to the internet. That's IoT. And in the cloud, Matchmaking is done and transportation shows up or food shows up. Yeah, so IoT sort of comes in. Don't yeah. try to do IoT. Try and solve problems. Technology will get you, will find its way. And yet Grab already now seems to be so layer one, right? It's, it's kind of like an Uber. It's, it's so layer one now. Um, how do you take that whole idea forward into the, you know, as we head into 2023, 2024, into the third decade? You have to be constantly, constantly paranoid. You know, Andy Grove said it. That's Only right. the paranoid Intel. survive. That's right. Right? I mean, think about it. In our own lifestyle, in our own li- uh, life cycle, I mean, you and I are not that old, Too but nonetheless, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in our own life uh, lives, we've seen film cameras get replaced by the uh, Minoltas of the world. We've seen the Minoltas of the world replaced by smartphones. We've seen two entire phases of industry disrupt each other and disrupt an incumbent. Right, we saw tapes get disrupted by the uh, 
podcast, the uh, iPods and the you know iTunes, and that be disrupted by streaming. So you have about three years of runway. And after that, if you're not trying to disrupt yourself, someone else is trying to disrupt you and you will never catch up. It seems to me that um, one of the biggest disruptive forces uh, we face today is this whole Web3 decentralized finance thing. And yet, what appears to me to be, well, at least in its past, used to be one of the most innovative countries, the US government. They seem to be pushing back, you know, people like Gary Gensler and the SEC, and they're fighting back against the Web3 guys. They seem to have lost the plot a little bit. And, and it seems to me that it's a bit of a wasted opportunity because this is one thing that you can really do to step it up and, and do things a lot better. Um, why do you think that happens? Well, so, I mean, Web3 is a very interesting concept. It's fascinating. I mean, you know, I spent uh, a few months in Malta trying to figure out NFTs. You know, I love it, right? Yeah. But actually, if you look at the number of killer apps, there are not that, there aren't that many. Mm. And proof of work is extremely wasteful. And then you have a consensus problem, right? I mean, there was an issue with too many uh, of these servers being in one country, like China at one point, right? So it's not flawless. It's an unbelievably, incredibly interesting thing. I mean, we still don't know who Satoshi is. It's fascinating. I think what it is, is because a lot of people don't understand it, it becomes a bit of a gold rush. We saw that with FTX, Binance, you know, we're seeing what's happening. So there is a great deal of concern about its viability of the viability of the business models and it's being uh, it's used as a cover for doing other nonsense, right? Under a veil of formal, right? So I think that's sort of what we're seeing. Uh, you know, Gary Gensler is at MIT. Uh, I feel like I need to defend him. Do you, do you know him? I mean, I've met him a few times, yeah. right? But that's not the. But the, my point is that's sort of where it's coming from. I think, right? I don't think it's a knee jerk opposition to to Web three. That said. Uh, I do think Web3 has many, many opportunities where I don't see it happening. For example, the ethical supply chains, things like that, right? It's more the sort of fintech world where we're trying to figure out exactly where the killer app is. Another application which I worked on is uh, is um, credentials, you know? So if you have a credential from one country and you can put it on, you know, some sort of blockchain, right? And let's say you're from, from uh, Syria and Assad wants you, uh, wants you to take away your dentist degree so you can't practice as a dissident in Germany, wouldn't it be great if your credential were on uh, on a blockchain of some sort? So these are applications, I think, that are evolving. But I think what you're seeing is not so much an opposition to Web3, but a caution given some of the uh, the uh, implosions that have occurred. Do you think the step is too far? Do you think the the leap in technology and, and, and cognizance of what's at stake is too far? I mean, when we saw how Barnes & Noble brick and mortar went under to Amazon, you kind of saw... You know the writing on the wall. When you saw how you know Virgin Records goes down to um, Spotify, you kind of see the point, right? And it's not too much of a stretch of the imagination. But for this, and basically your US dollar um, coming to naught, when when you can actually you know trade, I don't know, Bitcoin or Solana, right? And use that as a medium of exchange. And I I have to push back and say the number of apps out there is incredible. Where Web three is concerned, do you think that's Gary Gensler and his cohorts' big big problem with with Web three? Uh, you know, Gary Gensler taught Web3 when he was at MIT. Yeah, so, so, that's so he's pretty open to it. Right? Yeah. He's pretty open to it. Um, why, I, why do you think they push back then? I think the pushback is because uh, Bitcoin was also used in the colonial pipeline hack, you know, because BT, uh, FTX did collapse, because there are, other, there are other things. I think certainly I see the killer apps, I see the apps, you know, I've used them, right? As I said, I worked in NFTs. I see it. I think there's a sense that if it is not widely accepted and understood, it can also be a source of uh, malfeasance. Yeah, exactly. But what Spider-Man did say, right? With great power comes great, great responsibility. responsibility. Exactly. And wouldn't you rather harness it rather than you know, you know, keep it a, at a well, distance? Well, the funnily enough, uh, in fact, the Boston Fed was working with MIT. Uh, I think that's been paused on a digital dollar. I think digital currency initiatives are very interesting, right? So now that's not really Web three. That's a digital dollar. The but CBDCs, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So then you know the naysayers and you know the liberals who say, "Oh, CBDCs are meant to be, you know, there's the establishment coming after us, and yes, you know, it, yes. it kills the, the the free spirit of the of the of the crypto uh, universe and blah 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 blah." Right. I think that's fair, and that's some. By the way, yeah. that's one of the concerns with India, where in the sense that now that you have so much. Uh, 
uh, transparency and everything's attached to this Aadhaar number that I was involved in. Sorry. What happens to your privacy and what happens to other stuff? So yeah, I mean, it's that's my point. I think this whole thing's going to shake out. I think that what you what you're seeing in the U.S. is a little bit of concern that the pendulum's gone too far. Yeah. But I don't think these people are actually fundamentally opposed to Web three. I yeah. don't think so. Yeah. So there should be some elegant solution. Yeah. So in preparing people for you know what is definitely going to be a really strange and 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 weird world, right? Um, and AI is just the most scary thing possible. Um, education must evolve. The way we teach our children must evolve. I mean, as a parent myself, I'm a bit skeptical of the three de- three year degree program. You're stuck in some institution in some sense. You're paying big big money, especially at the top university. And you know the the syllabus, the curriculum tends to be a little bit static. In fact, more than a little static. And then they come out and they may not get a job immediately. Do you know what I mean? So it's, that whole that whole edifice seems to be crumbling. So you wrote about this, right? And you called it grasp, right? So talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, I think our education enterprises are behind the times, and they have been for about a thousand years. <laughs> uh, so uh, the point I'm trying to make is that. We are not the way we teach is not compatible with the way the brain works. Just as not the way the, at the speed the universe is moving. Well, that's leaving aside the speed of the universe. It's just the way we even you know fifty years ago we were teaching wrong. We were teaching incorrectly. You know the uh, concept of a ninety-minute lecture and somehow the you know the assumption that the professor has the pen and the student's brain is a sheet of paper and all you're doing you're doing is writing on it and declare, vic- de- declaring victory. That's ridiculous, right? I mean, you and I are sitting in front of plants. A plant wants sunlight when it wants sunlight. It wants water when it wants water. It wants potassium when it wants it. Nitrogen when it wants it. You can't give it a year's supply of water on day one and say, you're done. The human brain is similar. The human brain is actually a child or even an adult. We're forming a model of the world. And when I need, when I'm forming a model of the world, right, you need to give me information to plug the gaps when I need them. But the lecture model and the education model is quite the opposite. I'll give you a year's supply of water today because it's convenient for me, right? So that's got to change. And that problem is now laid bare in the era of AI and Web3 and all that when you have to learn on the fly. I mean, take AI, right? Uh, it's only, what, seven months old, the chat GPT, you know, eight months old, right? Now, where can you learn about AI? Where would you go? You're going to go back and get a master's? Really? YouTube. <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> you're cobbling people. together videos from YouTube That's and you're right. talking to a few. Is And yet, educational institutions have not stepped up. Yeah. It, I mean, how tragic is that? Yeah. Right? So we need an educational system that keeps up with it. And I call it the quaternary education system, right? Not tertiary, quaternary. And we also need to meld learning with work. Because when you learn something, you apply it, you learn better. This is the science. So what you're talking about makes a lot of sense. And in fact... Uh, this has been practiced, actually. It's not that new. The Germans and the Austrians and the, you know, they have apprenticeship subsystems. You're going to high school, you're apprenticing. You go to college, you apprentice. And they, that keeps both your learning uh, relevant, but also keeps the professors uh, on their toes. So I think we need to absolutely evolve to something like that. So basically, if you are driven in that way, there's a, a lot, there's a high element of agency involved now because if you were a driven and ambitious individual, you could conceivably learn a lot of this stuff on your own, especially with the free courses you know, offered by big, some of the big corporations. You need not go to a tertiary institution anymore. You need not pay that kind of money anymore. Right? So what value does... So of course, MIT is a different animal, right? Because it's, num- it's numero uno, right? And LSE and, and Imperial and all these other guys. But if you, if you were to not qualify for one of the top 10 global best of the best universities and the rest of the world is, you know, the rest of them are just commoditized, right? Then why bother? Well, I will still defend higher ed a little bit, not too much. Okay. So it turns out that uh, the prefrontal cortex, which is the you know the front of your forehead, the common uh, sense thing, it's actually not. It's the CEO of your brain. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And uh, it's the only human beings have it. I mean, even the great apes have only a very primitive version of it. Um, it grows in between ages seventeen or eighteen and twenty, twenty two, twenty three. I think mine never grew in, but anyway, it's the it's literally the CEO of your brain. Right. This is why. We don't let kids drive until they're a little bit older. We don't let them drink alcohol ever sometimes. And But yet, we send them to war at a younger I mean, age. So I think Kimi Raikkonen won the F1 world title at 17 or something. <laughs> right? So, But he's an outlier, right? Yeah, Obviously. but he's also, that's that's an instinct. It's that's not, right? right? Because they, right. They, you have a team coaching. They have someone with a, a grown uh, uh, prefrontal cortex, PFC, guiding them from the pits, right? That's instinct. Um, and he was unique. 
uh, he is unique. The challenge is you do want that incubation period where young people are learning certain disciplines, right? The discipline of, uh, for example, thinking mathematically, thinking about the humanities. I'm a big believer in the humanities, thinking philosophically. So I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The problem is we've taken that too far. I would say, I mean, I, would, I did not even think, I mean, this was after I wrote Grasp, of telling my kid, don't go to college. I didn't even think about it because I felt it was good. The problem is we don't do it right. We are doing too much of the philosophizing and too little of the practical stuff that young people need, both to enjoy the learning, but also to make it practical when they enter the workforce. And this is a balance that needs to be struck. So from the perspective of duration, cost, appeal, and applicability, how does the quaternary education system look like in, in your idea? Yeah, so what I just described is a tertiary education system. This okay. is until you're age 22 or so. All right. So this is when your prefrontal cortex is growing in and you want to sort of guide it. Quit. So, so you still do your undergrad? You still do your undergrad, but in a different way. What you do is you do a year, you do an internship for six months, you come back, you do a year, you do some online courses, and it's all baked into the de degree. I actually wrote a document about it, uh, which if you want, I'll put a, give you a reference to. A few of us wrote it and we wrote some articles about it. It's gotten some, um, some um, um, press recently. Now, the quaternary education system is what you need for the rest of your life. It's the gym you go to to stay uh, fit knowledge-wise. You go three times a week, right? We don't have that. There is no such thing as a quaternary education system except watching YouTube videos yeah. and then getting uh, hyg uh, you know, distracted by some video of someone doing something foolish, mm -hmm. right? We don't have, a, and we have, this is what we are creating. We created it at MIT. Um, at MIT, we call it Agile Continuous Education, ACE. And this is something at ASB we are considering, which is how do you create this quaternary, uh, lifelong, uh, Agile Continuous Education system? And this does not exist. So what is the difference between what you're offering or what you plan to offer versus what people can do in their spare time? whether it's learning to edit videos or whether it's learning to take f photographs or whether it's um, learning to code, you know. Yeah. Hopefully what what not, is the difference? Yeah, hopefully not such a huge difference, but there is a difference. Yeah. See, when you learn photography in your spare time, you love it, right? It's passion. It's a passion. You, you're you waiting for the moment you do it. That's right. So what we want to do is, the problem is you may not learn it right. You, may, you cobble together some videos and you don't understand, you know, how um, a... Uh, uh, an SLR is different from a camera that you know doesn't have you know a, uh, a similar lens and a similar uh, shutter system. So if you do it right, you can combine the two. So what you do is listen. Let me tell you how AI works, right? Let me tell you what large language models are. Let me tell you what embedding spaces are. Let me tell you what a neural network is. But I'll do it in a way that it is both fun, and you get your fundamentals right, right? So my little joke is you want to put the fun in the fundamentals. Mm. And then go do the AI. Go write a program, you know. Write a little game with your kid where the AI is, you know, mimicking mom or mimicking dad, right? So you have to, that's the idea. The idea is we want to keep the passion of the, the weekend ritual, but um, reinforce it with the discipline of getting it right. And then would the killer thing then be the MIT stamp on that piece of paper, which you then get at the culmination of that course, which would then be the, you know, the, the, the icing on the cake because, because that's what it means, right? I mean, otherwise, why, why would people go to MIT versus, you know, Sheffield University, for example? Sheffield University is a great school, by the so way. It's all right, but it's, it's a great know, school. It, ain't, it, ain't, it ain't MIT, you know what I mean? Yeah, but I think we need to move past labels. Now, okay. Now, so when I did, we, should we? Because we should. We should. Yeah, we should. I'll explain why in a second. I absolutely think we should. Uh, we, when we when I did it out of MIT, we gave MIT labels. If we do it out of ASB, it'll be ASB labels. If it's Sheffield, it'll be Sheffield labels. The reason we need to move past labels, though, is this. Um, it's like buying something on eBay. What do you look at? You look at the number of stars the seller had. You look at their reviews. We're moving into a gig economy. Your first job, your label matters. Your fourth job, it's the number of stars you got that matter. And if it's the number of stars you got, it's how well you did the damn job. That's a technical term. How well you did the damn job, right? And it doesn't matter whether you have a certificate. What matters is, did you learn it well? That's much more authentic, right? So we have to focus on learning for this new world. 
and the labels matter less and less. Well, let's see, because people are superficial creatures, aren't they? Especially Asian parents. They're like, go to Oxford, go to Cambridge, otherwise don't go to university, right? You know, because I don't blame them. Parents love their kids yeah. and they know the power of the proxy. Mm. But things are changing very fast. If you told me three years, five years ago, seven years ago, uh, when my kid wanted to visit, that I'd just ask her to ride home in a car that driven by a dude I'd never met, I'd scoff at you. I'd scoff. Yeah. Right? I'd be like, what the hell? Mm. Right? But I did that when I was there recently because it's Uber and I know that the driver is being tracked and I know there's a safe. Right? Things change, man. Let's get ready for change. And by the way, the gig economy is creeping up on us. You know this, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's what people like know. You, you've all know how Noah Harari talks about all the time that the future is all about individual, um, uh, individual experts offering their services for for you know for for hire on the internet. They're not working for corporations anymore, and they could be work, living in Bali or living in Costa Rica. They work seventeen very very productive hours a month. And that's enough to pay for the rest of the month and they can go skiing or surfing or whatever it is. And that's upon us. I mean, it's not already coming, it's upon us. It a is lot of upon us. Doing it. Yeah, and I think it's fantastic. It is. I mean, if you, why do corporations even exist? And I don't mean that in some sort of radical way. They exist, actually. There, There's a Nobel laureate, Ronald Coase. He wrote two papers, one in 1937 and one in 1960. I think he got the Nobel Prize in 1992. And he explained why corporations exist. Why do we make these big things? We make these big corporations because there's pool resources, right? You need a typist pool. And if you have a typist pool, it's better that you all work together and share the typist pool. There's a factory, right? But today, the reasons for the existence of corporations are going away. I use Google Docs. I don't yeah. need a typist pool. You've got SaaS, right? Yeah, I've got SaaS. I've got access to 3D printers, you know? I don't need all those aggregating forces. They're going away. That's called the transaction cost. The transaction cost is going away. So what that means is the idea of these big corporations sort of goes down, right? And that's why this is happening. I mean, in some respects, Ronald Coase predicted both the formation of companies, but without realizing it, predicted the demise of companies. And this is the future. And if you're in this future of the gig, really, by your fourth job, it does not matter if you graduate from MIT, Sheffield, or some um, unknown university. What matters is how good are you at your job? Your ability. Sanjit, do you think you're a success? Nah, um, mm, in some respects, yes. But uh, uh, there's a lot more I want to do, man. Okay. How would you define success? That's That was why I struggled. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Right? I will say I'm happy. What is happiness? I'm satisfied. I'm not sure what it means. I can tell you when I see it. I can tell you when I feel it. I feel, I feel I can be myself. I can be myself. And I don't, I'm not, I don't need anything. I'm not wanting anything. You know? I think as a collective, you and I have been around the block a couple of times, right? And at various points in our life, especially in mine, I think, I think to myself, have I lived up to my full potential? Have I, you know, am I classified as a success in the eyes of my peers and my parents and my, you know, my co colleagues? And then I ask myself, what is success? What is success in the 21st century? Because if we were to not have a goal in mind, especially for our children, then how can they plan and navigate their futures? Because they don't know what to aim for. Do you, do you know what I mean? Absolutely, because I think success is a proxy for something. Success is a proxy for happiness, but it may not be a good proxy. Mm. Happiness is the ultimate goal. So then it's a very personal yeah. um, caricature of what one deems to be successful and happy. Yes, yeah. right. I think I think you want to be happy. I think you want to be satisfied. I think you want to go home and sleep well. I think, and you know, even successful people have a lot of pain. You know, even happy people, something sad happens. You know, uh, a loved one passes away. You fall sick. You see something that makes you upset. And I think equanimity and you know the ability to go home and usually, generally, barring these other things, um, you know, have a uh, a pleasant, you know. Uh, last few minutes before you sleep and you feel good about yourself, that's about all I want. So, Sanjay, rules for life, man. <laughs> what are your rules for life? You know, um, I have uh, a few. One is authenticity, right? That's a very fundamental thing. You know, uh, you should be yourself. Um, the second is, uh, I believe a lot in curiosity, right? Which is, if you want to uh, be happy, you got to nourish the brain more than the rest of your body. And curiosity is very important. Authenticity means you're yourself. Curiosity is your brain is hungry and you're feeding it. And it prevents other sort of... Atrophy, for example. Atrophy, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, the third rule for life for me is uh, recognizing when something is inevitable and just accepting it. I don't mean not fighting things that you can fight for, right? But I'll give you an example. Why is Elon Musk both infuriating but also to some extent inspiring? Electric cars were inevitable. And there were a lot of people who said, oh, you can't make electric cars because, you know, you need a ton of battery in every car. And he said, why not? So it's that inevitability, you know? It's the Sherlock Holmes quote, right? When you've eliminated the obvious, what remains? I think he said something along the lines of, no matter how unlikely, has got to be the truth. And we trap ourselves in a bubble of what I call evitability, right? Which is, we think we can avoid it, but you know what's going to happen. You know, climate change is inevitable. Let's deal with it. It's going to happen. And But yet people have, you know, they've stuck their heads in the sand that they're hoping climate change doesn't happen. So that's item number three, right? That's item okay, number three. Okay, so let's dwell on that for a little while because yeah. I talked about this with Idris Jala, right? Mm-hmm. And I asked him about the um, his belief in karma, right? And his belief, not, not karma, sorry, the, the, the idea that or premeditation about how your life is kind of like mapped out for you by whatever that power being it is, right? And he, and I said to him, I said my, my ratio is 30%, um, you know, inev- inevitability, pre- premeditation, 70% input. And I was quite shocked that he said for him the ratio is the opposite. For him, 30% input for personal, 70% premeditation. I don't agree. I agree with you. Yeah. In fact, I would say 90-10. Yeah, all right. I'm, an, I'm a big believer in agency. You use the word agency right. earlier for learning. That's I'm right. a big believer in agency. Number one, and number two, when I'm talking about inevitable, I'm talking about logical inevitability, not fate. Right? I don't accept fate. It may be true, but I choose not to accept it. Okay. All right. I I I fundamentally believe that human beings have agency, um, and individual agency, uh, but logical inevitability you got to accept. Logical inevitability is the climate's going, you know, temperatures going up, CO two content's going up, and so we've got to find a way out of it. Well, taxes you need to pay, politicians will philander, and that kind of thing, right? <laughs> Item number four. <laughs> so, and then the the fourth action, the fourth sort of thing for me is uh, action. Right, you got to act. Don't be inert, lah. Yeah, yeah, you know, you just got to take the bull by the horns. Uh, and again, it doesn't mean that uh, you want to do something stupid, you know, reckless. But in your own sphere, if you can act, you got to act. You have a duty, you know. Um, you, you have your principles, and you got to act on them. Um, if you see something that's unfair, in your little way, do something about it. Yeah. You know, I believe in action. So those are my four. Okay, man. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I've been given the waving hand, so it looks as if we got to, you know, um, wait till the next one. But it was a huge pleasure, Sanjay. It's very enlightening, hugely illuminating. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you. Such a pleasure, John. Thank Great you. To see you man.